director of the Julia Schulman Institute at Woodbury University. And I'm pleased to introduce tonight's discussion between Pedro P. Guerrero and Hunter Romulo Scafil. We are thrilled to have so many people to help us celebrate Pedro's extraordinary contribution to the art of architectural photography, and hope you will join us for the opening of the exhibition next door after the talk. Before introducing Pedro and Hunter, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors for this event. Edward Chella of Edward Chella Art and Architecture has been an invaluable partner and gives credit for initiating this event. We're grateful to Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, of course, for generously hosting tonight's conversation. Thank you also to Diane Belden and Dennis Keeley for organizing Pedro's Lifetime Achievement Award, which we'll hear about towards the end of this program. And of course, a special thank you to Pedro and Dixie Guerrero, who partnered with us through every step of the exhibition's development and execution, including producing the bulk of the photographs in the dark room specifically for this show. It's been an honor and a pleasure to work with them both. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm pleased to introduce our two speakers tonight. Hunter Drogoyo Skinfilk is an author, author and art critic for KCRW and Artnet.com. She wrote the text for the Tashin publication, Julia Schulman, Modernism Rediscovered, um, as well as the definitive biography of Georgia O'Keeffe entitled Full Bloom. Many of you are likely familiar with her most recent book, Rebels in Paradise, the L.A. art scene in the 1960s, which received much praise, including my favorite from Dave Hickey, um, his com commendation that the text fleshed out, quote, all the backstories, the black stories, and the vendettas accurately. <laughs> she has also written an essay for the book, Pedro Guerrero, a limited publication by Cattle Track Press. Which leads me um, to our guest of honor, Pedro E. Guerrero. Um, Pedro has been photographing architecture since he was 22 years old, having just completed a degree in photography at what is now Pasadena's Art Center College of Design. He returned home to Arizona and visited Franklin Wright at Taliesin, where he introduced himself as a photographer for the first time and was hired on the spot. He went on to become one of the most sought after architectural photographers of the Mad Men era traveling around the world for major magazines and documenting the work of important modernists like Marcel Breuer, Philip Johnson, Edward Jarrell Stone, Joseph Salerno, and many others. His work um, photographing Alexander Calder and Louise Nelson shaped the later portions of his career. And as I learned today from um, today's interview with Pedro in the New York Times, he is ever the artist, now working on Calder-inspired sculptures at home. Pedro is the author of many books, including Pedro E. Guerrero, A Photographer's Journey, which was published in 2007 by Princeton Architectural Press. Um, and there are a few signed copies, I believe, left on the table next door um, for purchase if you're interested. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming Pedro E. Guerrero and Hector <laughs> I'm Pedro Guerrero, and I approve of that message. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to. We're we're back in Los Angeles, aren't we, Pedro? Where yeah. Else, where, where your where your this your important education began, with the big, uh, and you wanted to say something about how 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 you got to LA in the first place, back in. Well, I have a I have a very very low to slow to react to the things that have happened to me before. Although some of the stuff that I did, I did on impulse. But I left my hometown uh, because I couldn't stand the bigotry anymore. It, it, it's a lot worse now than it was then. But it, <laughs> and this is Mesa, Arizona. Mesa, Arizona, at. yeah. Tell us about the sign on the swimming pool. The what? The sign on the swimming pool. They had a sign on the oh, swimming well, pool. Oh, well, the sign on, on well, the, uh, to give you an idea of what it was like, the, the municipal park where all the swimming pools and the dance halls and stuff were right next to the Mexican barrio. 
but there was a sign at the entrance that no Mexican dogs or uh, uh, Negroes allowed. So, <laughs> so we had to use the uh, uh, irrigation dishes, which is a lot of fun. But anyway, we, uh, I, I, I could, I had a, a limited capacity. I could be a bilingual clerk at a department store, which I was, or I could be a carry-out boy at a uh, supermarket, such as they were at that time, or I could uh, work with for my father, who was a side painter, but he wouldn't hire me anyway, so. Uh, but he did tell you to get a job once somewhere. Well, yes, yes. but uh, he, he got jobs for me, mm -hmm. and uh, but he wanted something better for me. So when I left home on my 20th birthday, I came to Los Angeles, which I want to thank now for giving me the atmosphere that I needed to find a new person with possibly a craft or something where I would be accepted for what I uh, could do rather than the fact that, that I was brown, small, fat, but very cute. <laughs> <laughs> but that didn't help. So you came here and you went to Art Center and, and you studied photography and then didn't you go back to Mesa for the summer? And isn't that when your father is get mad at you and tells you to stop hanging around the house and go get a job? Pretty much. I must, I must say, I, I did come and I, I uh, uh, enrolled at the Art Center School. What made me think that I was an artist, I don't know. But anyway, I decided to show up at the Art Center School and uh, all the art courses were taken, but didn't matter because I didn't have a, a, a single sample of what I could do. So I asked them what else they taught, and they said photography. So I said, I'll take photography. I never thought of it before. But the minute I developed my first roll of film and made my first print, I fell in love with photography, and I knew I was never going to be anything ever again but a photographer. Uh, that may be one of the worst students that Art Center ever had. Uh, it was a commercial art school and I had absolutely no interest in anything commercial. I went out and photographed dead pelicans on the beach or on, on the beach. Or, well, if I remember correctly, you, had, you, you did some sort of risque photographs as well. So What's that? Some, rather, some risque photographs of women. Didn't you oh, take, well. You <laughs> Didn't you find well, when I good first good. came, when I first went to Art Center, my brother, who was more talented than I was, was already here, and I came to visit. And uh, they told me at the front office where, where he was at at the particular time. And this is part of my education, in, in which I think I get the atmosphere. I walked into the room where he was sitting, photographing what I then called a naked woman. I found out later that, that I should use the word nude. It sounded a lot better. Part of my education. But anyway, uh, because I, I love photography, nothing else that the school taught me uh, made me very excited. I must say this. Uh, I had to take other courses besides just photography. And one of them was with a perfectly wonderful woman named Fanny Kern, who taught uh, uh, at our, our art design. And she, she would inspire us with uh, uh, mu music on a, on a, on a recorder, the Blue Danube, or, or uh, what, any of those things. We had to paint something that, that inspired us. And, and she um, once gave an assignment. By the way, everything that I did uh, was laughed at, but I never, I never had a single sample that was stolen in my <laughs> I want to tell you tell these fine people how you took your photography skills out and showed them Frank Lloyd Wright. How did you get? How oh did you, well, tell let, let, let me tell let me get out of school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't, you don't tell us. I just want to tell about Fanny Kern. <laughs> Bless her heart, where she is. And she said to me, you know, you should really go to Sarasota, for, uh, uh, Florida, where they are teaching clowns to perform at the service. 
that was almost the beginning of deciding that there was time that I left the Art Center School. But the Art Center School uh, gave me a very bad crit, and they were right. I, they, uh, uh, Tim Cadam said to me, you came here with the idea of being taught, and you defy us to teach you. And that's true. So I went home, and I was uh, moping around, and Dad said, uh, Dad got tired of seeing me. Uh, working with my camera, not knowing what to do, and he said, "Why don't he had he had followed the career of Frank Lloyd Wright, and he said to me, why don't you go up on the hill up there and meet that fellow Wright? Maybe he needs a photographer.' And uh, but I might add, the hill up there is 24 miles away from Mesa, Arizona. About 24 miles away, but there was nothing in between. Yeah. Now there's got <laughs> there. <laughs> So you drive through the desert and you uh, drive And I got desert. there and, and Mr. Wright was, uh, I'd never seen him like that before. I didn't know really who he was. I knew he was an architect, but I didn't know much about architects or architecture. But he was standing there. I never saw him that way again. He was wearing khaki shorts, white uh, athletic socks, and open-toed sandals, a polo shirt, but he carried this marvelous cane and was waving to guests who were leaving at that fantastic pork pie hat. So he looked at me and he said, who are you? <laughs> and I said, my name is Pedro Guerrero and I'm a photographer. And you and I have corresponded. You said, come any time and here I am. So uh, he said, well, come on in and show me what, you, what you've done. So I had the world's worst portfolio, as I said, you know, little girl and a dog, uh, a dead pelican with a, <laughs> with a beer can in the middle, and a uh, of that, and dudes, of course. He often uh, looked up at me and smirked, or smiled, or was taken aback. And when I showed him the dudes, he said, oh, I see you have a fondness for the ladies. <laughs> and I said, they're school scientists, Mr. Wright. What do you expect me to do? You know, so. Anyway, uh, he said, uh, what are you doing now? And I said, uh, uh, oh, I'm looking for work. Now, by the way, I had, when I introduced myself as Pedro Guerrero photographer, I had never made a nickel out of photography. I had never shot a, a job. And I had never introduced myself as Pedro Guerrero photographer. But he gave me a job. After we'd been together for 15 minutes, he said, photograph anything that you want here. Everything here is important. So he, he said something like, uh, you can start now if you want. And I said, no, I don't have a camera. He said, I have a camera that takes good pictures. <laughs> and uh, I said, no, I better, I'd rather have mine. And uh, anyway, I'd like to go home and start early in the morning. And uh, I remembered that he said what he said about uh, he had a camera that took good pictures. And uh, I didn't like it at all. It was one that he had used himself that had uh, a lens, but it didn't have a shutter. So I had to use the cap uh, on the thing. And when, when he was doing it in, in, in Venice or where he was, it was easy for him to take the cap off the camera and say, 1001, 1002, or something. But by the time I got the camera, I couldn't very well make the difference between 125th and 115. So I gave up my camera. Uh, I, I ran into him one time, and somebody had asked him, Mr. Wright, what pencil do you use? And he said, Oh, my dear man, it's not the pencil, it's the man. So a few uh, uh, days later, he came upon me taking pictures, and I was taking everything. Which, by the way, I had never done architecture before, but I decided it was sculpture, and I uh, uh, photographed it for that. But he saw me working with uh, my camera, and he said, I told you that I had a camera that took good pictures. And I said, Mr. Wright, it isn't the camera, it's the man. <laughs> and he, he never questioned it again. <laughs> he was very, he was a lot of fun. He Tell us some things that you learned from Frank Lloyd Wright, because you, you really talk about how he was sort of a mentor to you, and he helped you see architecture in a certain way. What are some of the specific things? Well, I, I think 
I think what he did first was allowed me to go out and photograph whenever I moved me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I had a little time getting used to the architecture because I didn't know anything about it. And here he was building a fantastic building. Yeah, this is Taliesin West. Taliesin West in Scottsdale. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, out of desert sand and stone and cement and forms and so on. The only thing he ever said to me was that I want you to take a photo of my building and I want to recognize it as mine. And uh, now we, I, I, I've shrunk about three inches, but at that time we were about three inches apart. Now I'm about six inches or so. Anyway, uh, he, the only thing he told me was, I don't want bird's eye views, I don't want uh, uh, Warm side views. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I designed sitting down or at the most standing up, and I, that's the way I wanted. I don't, and, uh, but I, uh, he just let me go, and I photographed for maybe a week or two, and I could not work at Taliesin because he didn't have a lab. I went home every night and I worked on my own lab, and I came back in a couple of weeks to show him what I had done already. And he was very pleased. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was only one time that, oh, he, first of all, I told him that, as, as he could see by my samples, I knew nothing about architecture. But he said, well, I'll teach you. So, but he actually didn't, except once I brought something into him and uh, he didn't like it at all. And he said, I don't ever want to see this again. He was 72 years old at the time, and I figured, he's so damned old, he's not going to remember it, so I brought it back. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, I thought I told you, I didn't want to see this again. <laughs> so he said, tomorrow you bring the negative and the prints and a pair of scissors, and we're going to destroy that <laughs> And my, my greatest regret is that I didn't keep a copy of what he turned out. You know, I just destroyed it, mm -hmm. which is what he wanted me to do. But we had a great time. He was a playful, wonderful, generous man. And uh, uh, I uh, I was working. He said the pay isn't much, but actually it turned out the pay wasn't anything, you know. Uh, yeah, he didn't, he, first he didn't pay you anything, did he? He just paid no, the materials, no, no. right? He, uh, he said I could sleep and eat there and uh, pay was much. Now, you know, now we know that Mr. Wright was not, uh, was, was a bit on the, on the chintzy side. Oh, well, I didn't expect anything from him. I was so glad to be doing something, you know. And, uh, but... Uh, and by the way, you did call him Mr. Wright, your whole association. He never was. referred to him as anything but Mr. Wright. And then when you, at the, and then uh, the, I have to fast forward a little bit to say, you know, during the war, Pedro went and served, and went to the service, and then he came back, and he moved to New York, and thanks to the skills he'd acquired with Wright as a photographer, he was went on to New York City to become a successful commercial photographer for house and garden and architectural record and different things. And then, uh, but I want to say one more, uh, well, tell me a little bit about the difference of working for Wright and working with other architects after that, like Marcel Brewer. Or well, Johnson. you know, I didn't do everything completely. Mm -hmm. I was going to say right, but I said correct. <laughs> uh, while Mr. Wright was alive, mm -hmm. I didn't want to work for any other architect for fear that one day Mr. Wright would say, which he often did, uh, come and bring your cameras. And I didn't want to say, well, I'm sure I can't come because I'm working for uh, uh, Edward Dorrell Stone or something. So I turned down opportunities to do the work of other photographers like Marcel Breuer and so on, which is crazy because I lived in the same town with Marcel Breuer and, and those people. But this is when you're living in New Canaan, Connecticut. In New Canaan, Connecticut, yeah. But after a while, I would only do a job with another architect if a magazine had assigned it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't just going to go out and work for, for uh, an architect because he wanted to collect a bunch of negatives. But I, I was loyal to, uh, to Mr. Wright all the way through, and, and rightfully, because he opened every door I came to after that. He gave me my first job, 
And then I went into the war, as you just mentioned, and I came back, and, and by that time I was married, and, and I, uh, I could no longer just work at Talius, and so I went to New York, where I became quite successful, mostly because my samples after the war were only Frank Lloyd Wright samples. I didn't have anybody else. So uh, that was uh, always in demand. Huh? And in fact, you're the last photographer to take a picture of, of Frank yeah. Lloyd before he passes away. Well, yes. Uh, uh, when he was working on the Guggenheim Museum in New York City, he was living at the Plaza Hotel, and uh, uh, he uh, he wanted me to photograph what he had done. With he changed everything. He wanted, he wanted you to go back and tell us and to photograph yeah. it all over and again. And he wanted me to come later. back and photograph tell us it again. And this was 1958, December. So in February of 59, I went at his bidding to photograph tell us it. And he and I walked around the periphery of the of tell us it West uh, and showed me what had happened in my absence. And, uh, you know, and uh, wanted me to take over uh, and, and do the, the new stuff that he had done. Uh, by that time, Mr. Wright, and I didn't realize this until after the photos were printed, that he was beginning to show his age. For, for once, he was using the cane because he had to, not because they had a flare. And, uh, so uh, uh, I finally did the, the whole thing, the whole taliesin again, and I went and asked him if he would pose one more time. But I didn't say one more time. As it turned out, it was one more time. But I asked him if I could photograph him again, and, and he, he obliged. And uh, when I got through doing that photograph, uh, which turned out to be the last one, that was ever taken of him. And uh, I went over to tell him that I was through. Was there anything he wanted me to do it? And this would give you an idea what our relationship was like. He said, I want you to get a helicopter and fly all over the place and photograph Talies and, and some of the other buildings. And uh, uh, so I said, I, so I ordered a helicopter. The helicopter came and uh, I went in to see Mr. Wright, I said, Mr. Wright, the helicopter's here. What would you like to have me do? And he said, well, you don't, oh, he said, you know what to do. I don't have to tell you. And I said, Mr. Wright, why don't you come with me? You could, well, you could see it from up there and you can tell me exactly what you want me to do. And he said, no, one of us has to stay down here. <laughs> yeah, Lord. So I said, uh, what's the worst that could happen? The helicopter comes down, we go both get killed. The paper tomorrow is going to say Pedro E. Guerrero and Fred died top of the <laughs> He said, Get out of here, get out of here. And, and, and I never saw him again. And, 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 the, other, and, and the other person who was there was uh, Buckminster Fuller, wasn't that Buckminster day. Fuller there the yeah. same day? Yeah. So you got to say, see these two titans of. Uh, I, I, the only photo I have of Mr. Wright and uh -huh. Buckminster was little, two, two little figures. And the only reason I know that it was Mr. Wright is that his shadow had a cane. Uh -huh. or, or the cane had a shadow. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, no, that was uh, Buckminster Fuller. But Mr. Wright lived. Uh, another two or three weeks, and he might just as well gone with me on the hill. <laughs> <laughs> now you know, uh, you go back to your life on the East Coast, and you have uh, a, another important neighbor uh, in Roxbury, uh, Alexander and Louisa Calder, the yeah, Calders. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, you get asked by House and Garden magazine to go over there and photograph. Uh, do a story on the a man, the man in the kitchen. Yeah, that was a, a an assignment that. Uh, 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 house and garden was doing a man's influence in this kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I knew uh, Ele about Alexander Calder. I didn't know him, but I knew of him. And uh, so I was kind of intrigued in, in going to his place. It was in Roxbury, Connecticut. And uh, when, uh, as you mentioned, it was always Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright this, Mr. Wright that. 
when I ran, ran into him, Alexander Calder, he was having just finishing lunch, and I walked in, and he got up and gave me his hand and said, call me Sandy. And that's the first time I'd ever seen him. Now, leaving the well-organized, very well-designed uh, uh, situation where Mr. Wright would not stand for something on the wall that he had thought of, it was all pure right. Calder had, was absolute chaos. <laughs> absolute, it was wonderful. And uh, I became intrigued, but I knew perfectly well that House and Garden was never going to use those photographs because usually those magazines only published works that, that uh, they, in the illustrations would show a general electric stove, for example, or, or a refrigerator. There wasn't a thing in Calder's kitchen that were one that he had built cavities. He got, he flattened out olive oil cans and put frames around them and made trays out of them. When Louisa needed a spoon, special spoon with, with holes in it or something, he'd go in the lab, and, I mean in the studio and build it. And I was absolutely intrigued, but I knew that because there were three stoves in that kitchen, there wasn't one that was newer than 30 years. One wasn't working at all. <laughs> and on top of it was a, uh, a, a little gas burner and, uh, and another stove over there. So I knew that they, they didn't want it. And they were right. They turned it down. They said, we, we, we can't use it. So I asked for it. I asked, don't pay me for having spent a day with Calder. Just let me have the stuff I did. And they did. Later on, they changed their mind and they decided to... Uh, to do the Calder story, uh, to uh, enhance it. But they wanted a celebrity photographer. They, they didn't want me. And uh, one of Calder's neighbors was uh, Arthur Miller, who had buried a uh, photographer. I forgot their name. I'm sorry, I forgot her name. But uh, she uh, uh, did not do the job they wanted. So uh, they asked me to. Uh, bring my photographs back and go back and shoot at Calder's and I said I'm already doing that because one of the things I did when you turned down this work I called the Calder's and asked them if I could come back and, put, and document it. There was no book on Alexander Calder at the time so I worked on that and uh, we had a wonderful relationship. Uh, he, was, he was as informal as Wright was formal. Mr. I'm sorry, I said right. Forgive me. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I describe Mr. Wright as a perfect uh, 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 Hollywood version of a of a great architect. Tie to each. I, even in the desert, he was uh, dressed uh, to the dice, Even though that the boys were working half day on the, on the building. But uh, uh, I, I forgot where I was going. But with Calder, that. Was so, <laughs> Calder was so informal and so oh, warm yeah. and generous in comparison. Yeah. And you said he introduced, he really uh, brought out a lot more of your creativity. That working with him helped you. He felt you made, made you, you brought out another aspect of your creativity. Well, yeah, I, uh, you know, I. As a matter of fact, he's influenced me today. I'm doing. Uh, I get up every morning and, and work on mobiles, which were inspired <coughs> by Calder and Louise Devilson. Louise Devilson was a uh, picker of junk on the street and making art out of it. So I, uh, I, I collect rusty rakes, shovels, uh, saws, whatever I can find, mm -hmm. and I put them together in what I call rusted piece. And they, I've made about 60 of them now. And I have, uh, I could hardly wait to get up. I, I could hardly wait to go back to Arizona. <laughs> the reason, there's two reasons. Number one, people know that I use rusty material. And every morning I find new rusty tin cans or uh, all kinds of uh, ridiculous things. But I find they, they work out very well in mobiles. And uh, I think 
we had a call today or email today. If somebody want to know if we have to sell some of it. And as a matter of fact, we don't. We love them. You mean your mobiles? My mobiles. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing now. And they, they were influenced by Calder and by Nevelson. Uh, I didn't know Louise Nevelson for so long. I spent 20 years with Frank Floyd Wright. I spent about 60 years with Alexander Calder and about five years with uh, Louise Nevelson. And, uh, and they were really uh, labors of love because they, 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 they weren't paying me to photograph. They, they just opened their doors for me. But it's, it's given me a treasure trove of negatives and memories and, and uh, inspiration. Well, and I might point out that the, the Calder material in particular is, a, is a, it's a book that's referenced by scholars all the time because you get a really a, a sense of how Alexander Calder worked and you see, uh, and how he lived in a very intimate way. And you didn't clean up any aspect of the way Oh, he I wouldn't dare. Which, which you couldn't have anyway. Yeah, <laughs> but no. it's, it's, quite, it's quite wonderful. And then after uh, this, this glorious career in New York, you moved back to Florence, Arizona, which was the home of your great-grandfather and yeah. your grandfather and your yeah. father. And so... Yeah, we're, um, go we're going back. How long have you and Dixie been living there now? How long have I been living there? Yes. About 18 years now again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't want you to stampede out of here, but I want you to know <laughs> that the properties there are being given away almost. <laughs> uh, my son just bought an old historic building uh, that, uh, uh, that Union Spy Pauline Cushman lived in and Tom H. used to spend some time there too. I know a lot of these people I know know who Tom H. was. A lot of them don't, but Anyway, he bought the big historic house and three other little homes in a compound for $30,000 now. <laughs> Please, don't go. <laughs> <laughs> we have several members of the family that want to move there first. <laughs> but it's well, a wonderful it's town. It's charming. It's an old, old silver mining town. And... Uh, and and there is, aren't, isn't much commercial enterprise there. No, there isn't really. In fact, bring your uh, I, I, I think I blame our, us for the fact that it was a much better town before we moved there. <laughs> <laughs> it's been reduced down to a bank and a hardware store <laughs> and, uh, and us. But we're, we're uh, repopulating it. I have a niece that bought a house there and a friend of hers bought a house there, and I have a sister that has a house there, and we have three houses there, actually, or two, anyway. So and actually, you, actually had, uh, the whole, you own the whole town, basically. Yeah, we're going to own the whole town, eventually. <laughs> so, but that's where we are now, and uh, it's, it's, it's going to pick up. It's got to, because Tucson is moving this way, and Phoenix is moving the other way, so we're going to be caught in the middle. When you look back on this whole career, can you think of a single, uh, a single moment, so per se, or a single phrase that sort of helped you as you evolved? Something you ever went back to? Was there something that somebody said, or yes, yeah. it's something? Is there, is there it's something somebody told you along the way that really you feel was so terribly important to? Well, the, I, actually, the I, I think uh, going back to Mister Wright, it was his enthusiasm for my work and my friendship mm -hmm. that uh, uh, I never did anything that I thought Mr. Wright would frown upon. And, uh, and I did, you know, I had the great privilege of being in, in New York and having Mr. Wright call me and say, why don't you come have breakfast with me? You know, I don't know how many people uh, had that kind of uh, privilege. But here was this elegant man, and he and I would walk down the, uh, Fifth Avenue once in a while. He was going to some office, and I accompanied him, and he was impeccable and wonderful with cane and cape and everything. And I, little round, uh, short, cute. <laughs> 
friend of his trotting along behind. <laughs> he, uh, he was, I, I think he liked me because he was so tired of people talking to him ponderously, you know. They all ask uh, wonderful ponderous questions. And I didn't, I, 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 I was full of small talk. I can't give you an example of that unless I'm doing it now. <laughs> and uh, uh, he used to have jokes. He wasn't a very good joke teller, but I remember walking down the street with him one time and he, he said, uh, did you hear about that man that committed suicide last night? I said, no, I didn't. He said, well, it was in the paper. He said he left a note saying that he was tired of buttoning and unbuttoning himself. Now, I didn't think that was very funny until very recently. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you see, I'm very slow to react. Well, also, you get to be, for a short, very short time, you got to be an apprentice with the fellowship. And, uh, and one thing I, I remember you saying I think is so important is that that, that apprenticeship was, it was about how you dress, how you speak, how you behave to other people, what you eat, what music you listen to, what books you read. It was an all-encompassing education all, all for all the architects. Yeah, yeah. And actually, you were there when uh, when John when uh, Lautner, John Lautner was there, and Gordon Chadwick was there. So yeah. you all had the similar full immersion experience. All the years was briefer. Yeah, and, uh, it, it was a wonderful time. It was a wonderful time. Uh, there came a time, there, he, he could be very uh, uh, strict sometimes, but uh, when I saw the fellows loading cars, and I asked one of them, what's going on? They said, we're, we're moving to Wisconsin. We don't spend the summer in Arizona. So I went to Mr. Wright, and I said, that, hey, what's going on? And he said, we're, going, we're moving to Wisconsin. And I said, what's going to become of me? He said, what do you want to become of you? I said, well, can I uh, join the fellowship? And he said, well, you have to have three letters of reference. <laughs> <laughs> I'd been there four or five months, and I hadn't raped anybody or the building or anything. <laughs> and Arizona was very small in those days. Uh, it is said that Arizona... Uh, every member of the state of Arizona could fit in the Coliseum here in Los Angeles <laughs> and have a little room left over for Nevada. <laughs> and, uh, so I went, and, and but Arizona was small, and as it turned out, uh, one of my dad's Rotarian friends was a pharmacist who became a, uh, a governor. And so I got a letter from him uh, and uh, a couple of other people. Showed it to Mr. Wright. I thought they were pretty impressive. Mr. Wright said, is that the best you could do? <laughs> and I said, I only had a couple of days. So anyway, he never forgot the, uh, the governor thing. And the summer that, uh, that I spent in Wisconsin, he kept me busy in the lab all the time. And I could not go out and take advantage of this fantastic uh, um, atmosphere that I had never seen before. You know, trees. <laughs> Grass. <laughs> and, uh, but he, when he went back to, uh, when we went back to Arizona, he had, uh, uh, he, he brought a lot of the stuff that was canned, because we, not we, but they, uh, I only made prints and stuff like that. But anyway, uh, he had two big five-gallon buckets of honey and uh, they were confiscated at the border in Arizona, and he was livid. <laughs> and he came to me and he said, I want you to tell your friend, the governor, that I want my honey back. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know what I was going to do about that. I'd already asked the governor about So I went home and mulled it over and decided to hell I'm not going to do anything about it. But when I got there, there was a truck from the agriculture department from the state of Arizona that had just delivered the two cans and Mr. Wright was standing there beaming. <laughs> and he said, now, that was very good. It didn't take very long, did it? And I said, <laughs> Nothing at all, Mr. Wright, any time. 
Uh, but he was fun. He was fun, as well, you know. Well, as, 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 as Aaron knows. Huh? Well, he also, I guess he also, didn't he also want you to pay tuition, having not having not paid you much for the whole time you've been working there? He also well, he to did. Uh, so <laughs> once I got my, uh, uh, he accepted my uh, letters of reference, and he said, well, these are due. And I said, now what? He said, well, it's, we have an eleven hundred dollar tuition. I said, I, why did you tell me that before? I wouldn't have had to go to all the trouble to get the other stuff. <laughs> he said, well, we do give scholarships. And uh, so we'll give you a scholarship. So I said, what does that mean? He says, well, you're a member of the fellowship. I had expected somehow that he might have even tapped me on the back with his cane and said, you are now a member of the fellowship. And <laughs> He just said I was a member, and I said, now what do I do? And he said, pack, we're leaving tomorrow. <laughs> so I left Arizona not to come back for nine months, and this really, except for going to Art Center, uh, but I went home from Art Center uh, to, uh, on Thanksgiving and things like that, but not when I was a member of the fellowship. I spent it all over there, and I loved every minute of it. So... It was, it was a, and, and you know, this is ridiculous because this was 74 years ago, and here I am still talking about it. And, uh, well, actually, you're about, um, let's see, three years older than right when he passed away. That's right, that's yeah. Right. So you're almost, yeah. you're close to right stage now. I think uh, we're cl coming to the conclusion of this part of our program. Uh, First of all, let's thank Pedro. I approve that. <laughs> I also want to thank at this point uh, uh, Emily Anthony and Julia Schumann Institute and there are good friends, Edward Chella and Diane Belden, and uh, there, there are others of you here, but uh, I, I'm not leaving you out because I don't appreciate you, it's just that it's not written here. But, <laughs> uh, last but not least, my dear beloved wife, Dixie Legler, who made all this possible. Hi, my name is Andrew Conlon. I'd like to introduce Dennis Keeley. He's the chair of the photography and imaging department at um, Art Center. And I just wanted to point it out, the same art institution that Pedro attended from 1937 to 1938. Dennis Keeley. Boy, this is quite a, quite an evening. And uh, you might think as, as a as the chair of photography that I would be used to speaking all the time, making speeches, but um, not in these kinds of circumstances. Um, I was as caught up in this conversation as, as you were, and uh, everything that I was supposed to say just went right out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I know it must be warm in here, but I think I feel warmer than anybody. <laughs> Um, these moments don't happen very often. Life is made of a lot of common things that that that, that photographs are about. That, that you've heard that that people with great vision, creative people, look at something and and don't make a picture of it, but interpret it. And and they do this with such ease. They do this so professionally. And what you heard from Pedro is that. The stories that accompany these pictures are, are more like the stories we all have in our lives, but the pictures are phenomenal. The pictures are extraordinary. They explain a kind of greatness about life that can't be explained any other way. Um, as, as we would trace back his roots to Art Center, 
we would love to trace our roots forward from there to where we are today. It honors us that he went to school there. Um, it's what I do for a living is 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 contextualize a kind of poetic history and a kind of capability in the present and a, and a curiosity about the future. And in this time of, of digital complexity, we still see that pictures are made by people, for people, and that, that pictures don't change the world, people change the world. People see the pictures that people make and they are charged then to, to, to respond. That, that these pictures were about architecture, but they were they were really about about Pedro de Guerrero. They were about a, a, a partnership with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. It was about a, a two great things coming together in a remarkable time, and the results of that are something that will um, go forever. We will never be able to be in this room ever again at this time. And, and we're here because of photography, and we're here because of Pedro Guerrero. It's, it's a really important moment. Um, that wasn't any of the things I wrote down. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I have to follow a, a bit of something that, because that, I really wanted to get this right. Um, these moments don't come along very often. But, uh, um, <coughs> Can I hold that to you? <laughs> no way. I will give this to you afterwards. But, um, in recognition of a lifetime of remarkable practice in the field of photography, it is my honor to present the Art Center College of Design Lifetime Achievement Award to Pedro E. Guerrero. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm going to take a sip of this water now.